I didn't get a head start in life at all. If anything, the deck of cards was stacked firmly against me. And I got to where I am today by sheer force of will. I think that in life, if you're realistic enough, you can achieve anything that you want. Hello and welcome to the 32nd episode of Varvet International. I'm your host, Christopher Triumph, and I'm extremely excited to share this Noel Gallagher interview with you guys. It's one of the best to date, if you ask me. But before that, let me tell you about our sponsor, Squarespace. Yes, the legendary Squarespace. It's a great tool for building websites. This is great since Varvet International doesn't really have a website yet. I'm not sure why we just didn't come around to it, but now it's time and I'll use Squarespace to build it. And I think you should go have a look at squarespace.com. It's really easy to make your website look very beautiful, very professional, and it's cheap from $8 a month. And one of the greatest things about it is that it's a one-stop shop. Email, hosting, it's even possible to integrate e-commerce in there. You can try it for free and with the promotion code VARVET, you will get 10% off once you go for it. So thanks for that, Squarespace. Go check out squarespace.com. I'm going to be honest with you and a little self-centered. In August, I've done Varvet International for a year. It's been a great journey. I've got to meet some fantastic people. I've seen great places. And I realize that I'm very privileged to have been able to do this project. But I've also thought that I should quit doing it. It's really expensive, and after all, does the English-speaking world need another podcast with a man speaking to other men or people? And up until the meeting with Mr. Gallagher that you are about to listen to, I thought that my upcoming interview trip to Los Angeles in August would be my last, at least with Barbet. But then I met Noel Gallagher, and now I feel like going on for a really long time. Because you and I are going to live forever, as Oasis once sang. And also, well, let's say it was inspiring. I think you'll understand what I mean in about 40 minutes. But never mind me. Noel Gallagher was born in 1967 and raised in Manchester. In 1994, his brother Liam and the rest of the band Oasis became the world's biggest rock stars. Some 15 years, 7 albums and quite a lot of turmoil between the Gallagher's later, Noel left the band in 2009. Then he did some solo gigs and in 2011 he returned with Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds, with which he released a second album just a couple of months ago in March. And that's why he came to Stockholm in June to play at the amusement park Gröna Lund and if you listen closely you can probably hear people screaming from the free fall ride just behind us I'd also like to give you a couple of more notes before we start A. This episode contains some profanity the F words won't be bleeped out and B. I'll also say couch when I mean coach in a while sorry for that And that being said, roll the tape, please. While I set the sound, what have you done today? Mm -hmm. I woke up, and I got out of bed. I had some breakfast. Then I had a shower. I went for a walk, I got extremely hot, then I had to have another shower. (laughs) That's what I did. Okay. And this was in Stockholm? This was in Stockholm, yeah. All right. Yeah, I've never been here when it's been this hot before. No, it's uh, it's quite, amazing. Yeah, but it's it's even hotter in England. I heard. Well, yeah, I don't know. It's fucking pretty hot here. Let me tell you, it's good. It's good. Not to put any pressure on you, but you seem to be like perhaps the world's best interviewee. <laughs> and the pressure's on you, not me. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you seem to always have been. How do you develop that skill? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know whether it is a skill. 
I was going to think and answer that off the top of my head and say, all I do is answer the questions honestly, and it's not an act. I just answer the questions honestly, and there you go. Yeah, I was thinking that perhaps it's the fact that you seem to be quite fearless. I suppose, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I don't feel any fear, particularly doing interviews. And I, I, I have opinions, and I'm not ashamed of them. And I think in the modern world, it's not really the done thing to have opinions, is it? No. You know, I was talking to a guy before, and I was saying, I think ninety percent of the interviews that I don't read them anymore, but that you see, you're fucking just dull. Do you know what I mean? Now, clearly, a lot of it is to do with journalism as well. You know, journalism. The golden age of journalism is over. I think I probably got the back end of it in the nineties. There was some kind of there was some kind of good journalist. So I do I do interviews now with young journalists, and I swear to God they are fucking idiots. You know, it's the same old fucking questions all the time. Now the same old questions are all right if you ask them slightly differently. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's entirely an artist's fault. The journalist must, and and yeah, the writing is so bad, and it's all quite generic, and uh, yeah, boring, which is the worst thing you can be. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, maybe I can put your opinions to test then, because we had like the UKIP had a great election last time, and we had the same thing here in Sweden with a really far off right party right. doing a very good election. Do you have a thought on why that is? I didn't. I didn't realize UKIP <laughs> did have a great election. Didn't they? I don't know. I wasn't aware. I don't okay. know. I don't. I think didn't everybody do badly apart from the Conservatives? I think you. They were at like twelve or thirteen percent or something oh, I don't, like I, that. I, I wouldn't. I don't know anything about the figures. But you know, I mean, look, UKIP and all those things. I guess I see them. If you're asking my opinion, which yes. I'm assuming you are, Thank you. I, I see them as any other political party. A tiny little bit of what they stand for makes sense. As the same with the Labour Party, a tiny little bit of what they stand for makes sense. And the Conservative Party, a tiny little bit of what they stand for makes sense. But in the in the case of all of those things, as an overriding ideology, capitalism has proven to be quite unfair to the more vulnerable members of a society. By the same rule, socialism or communism is equally unfair to aspirational people in a society. By the same rule, the Green Party, for instance, do you know what I mean? Although we'd all like to live on a cleaner planet, you know, if they got in, forget fucking computers and cars and all that shit, but that's unfair as well, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now the same applies to UKIP. Do you know what I mean? As an as I, I mean, I don't, I'm not really aware of what they fucking stand for, but as an overriding I- ideology, it seems a bit ridiculous to me. There's a lot, and the, and and the people that front those kind of far right parties are usually fucking idiots. Do you know what I mean? But um, I think if if one was to take a tiny little bit of UKIP and a little bit of Labour Party and a little bit of Conservative and a little bit of the Green Party kind of mush it all up you would come to some kind of common understanding with for the majority of people but as politicians are not into politics they're into power and there you go did you vote i didn't vote no so i don't i shouldn't really be giving you my opinion on it because i certainly won't be complaining about it but i didn't vote no not but because i wasn't a protest i was actually away on tour and i forgot to fucking register to vote because i was like living a rock and roll lifestyle baby <laughs> <laughs> all right i was in america at the time so i fucking forgot all about it but it wasn't like a, a russell brand statement then no if i would have voted i would have voted for neither of the, any of the parties i wouldn't have voted for the labor party because they let the people down last time they were in power and they proved themselves to be as slimy as the conservatives so i wouldn't have voted for them and the, for the fact that they're fucking communists and i don't want to live in a communist country mm. i wouldn't have voted for the conservatives because they're fucking sleaze bags and public school boys 
and not really compassionate to the more vulnerable members of society. So I wouldn't have voted for them, and I wouldn't have voted for UKIP because they're fucking insane. I would have voted for something stupid. Like the last election, the one before that, I voted for a pirate. I thought pirates were cool. Yeah. Keith Richards and Johnny Depp. What's not to like about that? Exactly. <laughs> You've toured the world many times. Uh, do you like feel a connection with Stockholm or Sweden? Well, yeah, there's something about... If I go back to the beginning, when I first came here in the 90s, it's very easy to communicate with people in, in Sweden because they are very aware of English culture. And at that point, I wasn't aware of a Swedish music scene. I was aware of ABBA and all that, and I fucking loved ABBA, and I still do. So it's very easy to communicate with girls, and we'll speak English and all that kind of thing. So that helps. And then as the years progressed, you you find out about these great Swedish bands like the Soundtrack of Our Lives and the Caesars and the Cardigans and and onto the Monday like bands like Goat and stuff like that. So for the music that I listen to, I found a very common connection with those people. I mean, I wouldn't be as arrogant. To, I don't know what Swedish culture is outside of the music thing, but the the people that I've met that are in Swedish bands are fucking amazing people. Like really, really are amazing people with great ideas and and they're fearless. The people that I've met in Swedish groups. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm walking around Stockholm today, and it's like the hottest day on record, and it's got a very relaxed atmosphere to it. Whereas in London, there's a slight. It's, London is obviously it's a not busy and there's a slight edge to London like a bomb could explode at any fucking minute because of its politics and it's you know the shit that goes on mm. with its foreign policy Sweden seems very calm and maybe it's because we're in the harbour and the water is kind of quite calm and I don't know but I've had a good day I must say that's nice to hear you also worked with a Swedish singer Magnus Carlsson in what respect did I work with him uh, you invited him last time you were here oh on the TV yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I've known Magnus for a while and his friend Robert and uh, was miming something on some Swedish TV program and it needed a brass section. I just invited those guys. I didn't. I wasn't actually aware that Magnus was a singer. He's just a friend of mine. Okay. And then he informs me he's in a jazz. He's like a jazz singer, right? Or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're good boys. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. They're nice. They're good to hang out with, and they run a nightclub called Bangers and Mash, which I will be going to later on tonight. I believe. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Speaking of music then, uh, you were quite uh, late in joining up on the new digital technologies and so forth, and you also slaughtered the uh, Tidal launch. That being said, how do you feel about Apple Music? Streaming and Spotify to me is, although it is clearly the future and where it's going, I saw people who are wiser than I am tell me that that's it. But if you're telling me now that the record buying era is over, that makes me sad. That the culture of buying and owning and believing in a record and now that era is now dead and we usher in a new era of music is for rent and for hire and the money that you pay lets you access everybody's music but own none of it. I think that's a sad day. I understand that it's the future, but I think it's a sad day. But it, the tidal thing just seemed to me I don't know the nuts and bolts of it and I don't really fucking care it just seemed to me a lot of self-important rock stars saying with a straight face with no fucking hint of irony that they were going to save the music business I, I was pretty fucking quite offended by that you know what I mean because there's only one thing going to save the music business and that's fucking good songs you know what I mean never mind business deals or entrepreneurs or fucking this that and the other madonna was cool she always remains cool the rest of it was farcical apple music world radio what is that is that some like fucking george orwell shit that's going on do you know what i mean Who, who's arrogant enough to say we now fucking are on world radio fuck you do you know what i mean did you listen to it it came up on my phone yeah so it's there Why, what would I listen to? It's not playing the kinks. No, no. Unless there's a fucking... Unless... I don't know, I've not really got into it, but unless there is a genre which is devoted that says Noel Gallagher's music selection, I think I'm not fucking interested in it. What... I don't even know... What... The, the theory behind it is what, exactly? That you pay, a, again, this £10 a month... I guess so, yeah. 
And then you think, hmm, I'm in a jazz mood today. I'm just going to put some jazz on. But you're not listening to what you want to listen to. You're listening to someone else's play. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. No. I don't know. And they also sold it with the, with the um, argument that you could sort of stay in touch with the artist. But, I mean, wasn't that what MySpace was all about 15 years ago? Who gives a fuck about what the artist is doing? Who cares? It didn't... My love of the Smiths never suffered because I didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> they were either on tour and then they disappeared and then they put an album out and you went, wow, there's an album coming out. Fucking hell. What's it called? Nobody knows, you know. Who cares what fucking Tom York is up to? Seriously, who gives a shit? No, but I, I, I would find it... I'd find it creepy if everybody wanted to know what I was up to. I'm not really up to... You know, do you know what I mean? Who gives a shit? And I, I, what, does, what does staying in touch with the artist mean anyway? What do you want to do? Get inside his mind. Why do you want to get inside his mind? Listen to his music, then fucking buy it. That's it. Yeah. See him perhaps wa wash his clothes. See him, but yeah, I don't... Or her. I don't understand. I don't, I don't... I mean, there's things about the digital age which are clearly fantastic. You know, families can be interconnected all... If a family is spread all over the world, like, you know, the parents live in London and they have a daughter who lives in Los Angeles and a son who lives in fucking Dubai and, and they can stay in touch through Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of thing. That's clear. But when celebrities and fucking shit take it over, it becomes, like, somewhat weird. Do you know what I mean? But you being on tour all the time, I mean, FaceTime, do you FaceTime with your kids? No. I think I've FaceTimed maybe twice. Not because it's not like a principal thing. It's just... It's fucking, it's just I never think of it. <laughs> it's just phone, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always on the phone. And I do have... Um, you know, I do have an Instagram account. I know. But it's quite... I don't take it seriously, do you know what I mean? It's like people... Don't, like, the whole fucking life and shit is dependent on the reactions of the internet. You know, I still remain... A guy with a guitar that just sits down and writes songs. For who? I don't fucking know. You know, for how many? I don't fucking care. You know, when is it coming out? I have no idea. But you'll be the second to know when it does come out. You know what I mean? Mm. That's it. I don't... I mean, 99% of artists today, they take it so fucking seriously. The internet and the digital thing and all blah, 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 and this, that, and the other, and tweet this and fucking tumble of that. But this is, this is the dawn of the new age, you know? But you are uh, quite a frequent Instagrammer, though. When I'm on tour, yeah. I mean, now, I started this the night I started the tour. When I'm not on tour, it won't be active. Okay. You know what I mean? It won't be like, hey, this is what I'm eating for breakfast. Woo! You know, eggs! <laughs> Who loves eggs? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's a way of... Because I used to do a tour diary... And to be honest, the, the, I've got such a fucking pain in the arse trying to... I felt... How this all came about was I was doing the tour fucking thing. And really, every tour that I've ever done has been the same. It's just you wear different clothes and you've got greyer hair and you put on a bit more weight and you play slightly different songs to a slightly less enthusiastic audience. And... So I was writing these things, I was thinking, well, I've fucking said all this before. I'm playing the same venues, I'm staying in the same hotels. And I thought, I'm not doing it. The blog, or whatever it was, the tour diary. And people said, oh, well, oh we've got to do something. And then my daughter said, why don't you do Instagram? All right, what's that? She says, that's just tiny pictures, and you just put a little caption. It's like, ah, now, well, that seems like quite fucking easy. Lo and behold, you know, there we go. But do you do those little doodles? Yourself? No, 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 no. No, they're by an artist called um, Hazel B. I'm not that talented, Jesus okay. Christ. I'm not like a fucking songwriter and an artist. It's by a, a, an artist called Hazel B. She's not a friend of mine. I've never met her. I just I found these postcards. And uh, from time to time, they seem quite apt for what's going on. And uh, there seems to be one for, <laughs> for every occasion. I'm running out of them, though. No. All right. Reading up on you, you seem to... I mean, f first of all, you are a really funny guy. Do you have any idea where your sense of humour comes from? I have no English blood in me. My parents are Irish. So there's that. There's being working class and coming from a very poor background. There's that. And then there's being a Mancunian. 
So there's that. But I, I guess I tried to find famous comedians from Manchester, but I didn't really find any. No, there aren't any. <laughs> no. John Cooper Clark, okay. maybe. He's from Salford, though. Then you're number one on my list. Ah, oh, well, thank you very much. But saying that, Morrissey is very funny in mm-hmm. his interviews. Mm-hmm. Mark E. Smith from The Fall is very funny oh. in his interviews. Sean Ryder is very funny. So it must be something in the water. Again, I don't know. I don't try. I don't try to be funny. I don't know. You just are. So they say. Have you always been? <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to have someone that's always known me. I must ask my mum. See, when you're before you're famous, it's called being a smart ass. As soon as you're famous, they go, "He's a funny guy." Man, yeah. you're, a, you're, a, you're a fucking funny guy. Okay, thank you. You've also come back to your love for Seinfeld. Oh yeah. Could you verbalize why you love that series so much? When it first aired in England in 1995, I think I know for a fact I was the only person in England watching it. I don't know. I didn't know anyone. Anyone. All of my friends. Do you watch that Seinfeld thing? No. What's that? Oh, it's a fucking thing that's on whatever it was on. I don't know what side it was on. What's it about? It's about nothing. (laughs) So I didn't know anyone. And uh, I just love. I fell in love with the characters immediately. And then all the secondary characters, like Newman and the Soup Nazi and all the... And it's just the best thing. Is I, I watch it every day. I watch it every day. Still? Uh, when I, yeah, still when I'm at home. If I've got like an hour, I'll watch like two Seinfelds. I don't give a... I've fucking seen them all a million times. How about Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yeah, yeah, I like that, but not as much as Seinfeld. Mm. You can't beat George and Kramer. And uh, recently I've been watching the, the, you know, the, what they call the bloopers, the outtakes. You know, Elaine Bennis, she's an attractive woman when she laughs, it's got to be said. She's, uh, she's fucking great. Do you watch uh, Veep? No. Okay. No, I'm not interested in any of the spin-offs or any, any of that shit. I don't... That, for me... And when I met my wife, I didn't know she was going to be my wife at the time. I said to her, have you seen Seinfeld? No, what's that? And I was like, oh... Hmm. It was a bit of a test, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, luckily, it was on. And I, you know, because sometimes you get good ones and bad ones. And uh, a good one came on, and she fell in love with George. And uh, that was it. I can't. I can't. I, w- I would watch it all day. I would watch. I would watch the full nine series back to back. And then when I watched the first one, I'd go to the toilet and I'd go back and I'd watch them all again, and I'd still get the same amount of enjoyment out of them. Because I fucking love them. To me, it's like the Beatles. Is there something that makes you laugh as hard that's English? About with Seinfeld? No, Seinfeld's no, no. just clever. Exactly. It's fucking clever. And modern day comedy is broad and fucking dumbass. And it's just clever. Do you know what I mean? And I like clever stuff. I don't like modern comedy, particularly... In England, there was this fucking thing that was on a few years ago, and I never watched it, and I and I, I didn't have to watch it because you just seen the fucking trailers and you just thought these fucking idiots insulting people's intelligence. Called the In Betweeners. Did you ever watch that? I haven't. So no. Don't ever watch it. Okay. I've never seen a fucking episode, but I, I, it's just toilet fucking humor, just dog shit. And mo- most things that are on British television now are terrible. Did you like the trip? The trip was amazing, the, particularly the first series. Yeah, again because it's clever. Do you know what I mean? But that's what that's 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 one thing that came along. I didn't like the second series. The first series was fucking great. But f- if you go from the trip backwards, that had been the first thing that had been on that was any good for fucking ages, for years. So where will the next thing be? Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure. Louis. Louis C.K. Yeah, oh, I love that guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, sure, I'm not too sure about the sitcom thing, though. No, but it's pretty great. Yeah, but Seinfeld's already done it. No, but not the sitcom sitcom, but his series, Louis. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of, yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind yeah. of like, I know it's not a sitcom, but it's kind of like, you know, his neurosis going through life, which is, 
you know, he's a fucking, he's a brilliant comedian, yeah. but he's American, do you know what I mean? But he's great, yeah, he's amazing. And would you say then that your humor is more American than English? Mine? Yes, or, yeah. I'm not a comedian, I'm not a comedian, I wouldn't no, no, say no. my humor is anything, I would... Your taste in... <laughs> I'm not going to sit and discuss like I'm a comedian or something, I'm just a rock star, right? Yeah. It's difficult enough for me to say those words, <laughs> far less discuss my fucking sense of humor. That's, you know... That's not for me to say. Okay, all right. On to the next subject. Congratulations on your recent success with the new album. Thank you very much. But you seem to be so cool about success or sort of don't care. Well, I treat it the same as failure. When I put a record out, I am 100% behind it and convinced that it's the best thing that I could have done at that time. So it doesn't... Whether it's successful or not is irrelevant to me. Mm. I'm putting it out there. I think it's great. I'm in a position where I have got to a point in my life where I'm allowed, through my own endeavours, to pay for and produce my own records, and I put them out into the world. And it's a brilliant position to be in. Yeah, I don't rely on a guy from a record company to do that. So if my if this record would have come out and sold no fucking copies, it doesn't make it any less of a record to me. But the fact that people are buying it and attending the concerts is fucking brilliant. It's great. And, you know, I don't really know how to sum that up into words. Do you know what I mean? When I get to American gigs, you know, not even in the major cities, and I turn up and there's 200 people waiting outside for autographs before the gig starts. That is a fucking wonderful thing, you know. And, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not naive enough to think... They're all there because of the high-flying birds. I'd say over half of them are there to sign Oasis records. I'm not that much of an idiot, do you know what I mean? But I did write all the songs in Oasis, so it's kind of my thing in a way. But um, I, I'm very pleased about it. But, I, but by the same rule as I'm not grateful to... I don't go... I don't, like, you know, go cap in hand to my fans and, oh, thank you, you know what I mean? They don't write the fucking songs. All they do is buy the records and come to the gigs. You know, they can't, none of them can play the fucking guitar, as far as I can see. <laughs> and um, I'm not the kind of rock star, or whatever you want to call it, who's like, hey, you guys, you know, I'm fucking... Because you do what you do is because I do what I do. I don't give a fuck about that. You know what I mean? I don't recall any of them being in the studio telling me to go to F-sharp minor in the, <laughs> in the middle eight. So I do what I do, and I'm glad people get it. I really am, but it doesn't... You know, I wouldn't if the, if this record, for instance, would have been a commercial flop, it wouldn't have made me the next time I go in the studio approach my next record any differently. Okay. You know, because in that sense, I'm not an artist who can turn his hand. Like if I'm Picasso, for instance, and the one day I thought oh, I'm done that, I'm just going to do blue from now on. I'm not. I I can't do that. I can only do one thing. And I'm at the mercy of inspiration all the time. Songs just fall out of the sky, you know. And I catch them and I put them out. So, and sometimes if I, you know, as songs fall out of the sky and they're like, that track, the right stuff, they're, they, you know, there's kind of things I've never done before, like saxophones and fucking jazz and all that. That's great. But it doesn't really colour my thinking about what I want to do next, do you know what I mean? I just, I just carry on, keep on keeping on, you know. But would you keep on keeping on if you would sell zero records? I would until the money ran out, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'd probably stop. <laughs> and then once the money ran out, I'd probably reform Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> so we can sort of... Happiness isn't selling records then? I mean, professionally speaking, it's the ultimate goal. But what I'm saying is, is it doesn't make... I'm in this to sell fucking shitloads of records, and believe you me, I don't think I sell enough. Do you know what I mean? But there's nothing I can... You know, I mean, what, what, you know, what am I going to do? Start writing pop music like Taylor Swift? It'd be, just be farcical. I can only do what I do. Selling records is great, and I would like to do more of it, and I think it's a travesty that people don't buy more of my records. But it's not... It's not, it's not, what, it's not n now at this stage of the game, it's less important for me to be the big daddy, as it was in the, but when we was in Oasis. Mm. We had to be the biggest and the best because that's what the band was fucking... That's what the ethos was. 
but now it's a bit more considered do you know what I mean and it's more about the records than it is about the thing I was sort of hoping that you would say that that isn't happiness and then I would ask you what is happiness for, to you well it depends it, what, it, it, I mean I live two lives I live a professional life which is what you see and then I live a private life which is with my family happiness in my private life is an ongoing daily thing you know what I mean I kind of my four year old son is at sports day today and my wife took a video of him coming last in a race and he's finished last and he jumped over the, li- the, the, the finish line in a very theatrical manner knowing that he'd finished last that's the most beautiful thing in the world because he doesn't give a fuck <laughs> he's just glad he finished the race so that's happiness do you know what I mean and so that's one thing today I wake up in Stockholm it's a beautiful day and I'm get to walk around the city and it's a fucking gorgeous afternoon and you know I'm touring the world you know I go on tour for a year and I see that that, that's happiness do you know what I mean so it depends on how you perceive it you know you meet when you do these kind of festival season around Europe you meet so many different kinds of rock stars it's fascinating to see you meet people how are you doing you know like Oh, yeah, I'm fucking so tired. Why don't you fucking retire then if you're tired? You know what I mean? And then you meet people who are just constantly fucking chasing it and chasing it. And then you meet people who are just kind of, you know, we're here, we're doing a show, we're going somewhere else after. Might be good, might be shit. Who cares? The sun's out. (laughs) Yeah. As a tip, you have to try to do FaceTime with the kids. It's fantastic. It's a game changer. Mm, Yeah, they call it... Well... It's ne- see now they'll be now would be a time where but well, we never get the right we're on different we're on different t- time schedules. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to be quite honest, if uh, yeah, my kids would rather be playing games on an iPad than listening to their dad talk about what <laughs> they had for fucking breakfast. <laughs> you obviously had a hard childhood, or you- well, it was. I wouldn't say it was any harder than all the other people I grew up with. It wasn't, it wasn't especially hard. It was maybe harder than yours, but it wasn't really particularly hard. No, but you were abused, sort of, right? Kind of, yeah. yeah. Have you gotten to be angry with your father? No. I haven't seen him for such a long time. I don't care. You don't? No. You aren't angry, then? No. I'm not angry with anyone. I, Liam, but you know what? The only one person I can fucking safely say who's angry in my family is Liam, and he's still, he's still not quite sure what he's angry about. Because it didn't happen to him, you know, so I don't know what he's got to be angry about. Maybe he's angry about that. I don't know. I'm not the kind of person that needs help sorting things out in one's own, in my own mind. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I'm just not. I'm just not. I don't... There's no dark corners of my conscience that I don't go to for fear of opening some kind of gate. Do you know what I mean? I'm not interested. I focus on today and tomorrow. So you've never done the therapy then? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. When I laugh there, I don't mean to belittle therapy or anything like that because clearly it helps people, but I'm not the kind of person that needs help. Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure it does. Well, then why do people do it? They think that it helps. I do know people... Well, well the one thing, though, is people who have been in therapy, they, they, it changes them in a way that they start to talk shit afterwards. <laughs> They talk out of their arseholes. <laughs> so maybe the subliminal thing, what a therapist does, is change, is just change the way that you speak. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and may, perhaps it makes yourself absorbed then. I just don't, agree. I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to the theory that all the woes in one's life can be directly attributed to your parents. Mm. I can safely say that I came, I didn't get a head start in life at all, if anything the deck of cards was stacked firmly against me. Yeah. And I got to where I am today by sheer force of will. And I, I think that in life, if you're realistic enough, you can achieve anything that you want. Now, I meet people all over the place who are clearly not going to be rock stars, but who think they are. And some people are, you know, unrealistic about it. Do you know what I mean? I think that having realistic goals... You can, you, you can achieve anything you want to in life. And not everybody can be a rock star, and not everybody can be famous, and not every person that plays guitar can make it. And there's a sense in young people that, that they can. Now, what I will say is that my 
my aspirations and goals were to be the biggest rock star in the world. But that didn't seem that outrageous to me. But um, And you made it. That's just me. Well, yeah. Yeah. Through sheer determination. Do you know what I mean? Because I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say I'm the most talented guy you'll ever meet. I wouldn't say Liam is the greatest singer. I wasn't the greatest guitarist. I'm not the greatest lyricist. Really, I'm not great at anything, but I'm pretty good at a lot of different things. And by magic, something happened, you know? Well, you're a godlike genius, right? Yeah, maybe a cod-like genius. I do like fish. <laughs> But back to your childhood, I mean, have you sort of taken a revenge on your own first years with your own children? Does that question make sense? Explain that, I don't know if that makes no, sense. I've, I was wondering that you had a shitty childhood, your children probably don't. Oh, they've got a fucking amazing childhood. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Is there a sort of a... But not for me, right? You know, they, they, they say that, you know, if you're mistreated as a child or you'll pass that down to your children... But somebody's got to break that chain somewhere down the line. And I'm not embarrassed for them or, you know, you just because I didn't have any fucking money to speak of until I was 26 or 27, I'm not going to deny them private school and nice clothes and fucking holidays and cars and all that shit should they want them. You're going to have to be a bit of a fucking arsehole to toughen your kids up and all that. I don't want them to be like me. Have I want you? them to be smart, intelligent, kind of, you know, guys. I don't want them to be like fucking scruffy oaks from a council estate and have that attitude, do you know what I mean? I don't want them to be like me. I want to be me, the only me in my house. I want them to be them, you know. But have they ever flown couch? No. no. Oh, and they never will. God forbid. <laughs> what, what, what kind of... What, I, I, I don't understand. So they've... No, why would they? I'm fucking, what would I do? Say what, you've got to go and sit in coach class because it'd be good for you. Well, some kind of reality check, perhaps. Who wants to live in reality? <laughs> that's fucking clearly nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not their reality, is it? Their reality is their life as they see it. Mm. I don't want them to live my life. I want them to live their life. So, so when they grow older, I might learn something. I'll never preach to them about the value of money and the value of... Oh, well, when I was fucking growing up, we never had all this shit. Who hey, well, fucking... So what? It wants to sound like a parent. When we were growing up, what was the first thing our parents said? Oh, what about the war? Oh, we fucking all things were tough in the war. I don't give a fuck about the war. I wasn't born. I don't give a fuck about Adolf Hitler or Winston Churchill or fucking any of those fucking idiots. They ruined the world. Well, saddle me with that shit. Do you know what I mean? I'm fucking bothered about the Beatles. Let's talk about that. You know, so I don't really want to pass down my, any of my, all I'd like to pass down to my two boys and my daughter is my fucking impeccable fucking uh, taste in shoes and maybe my impeccable taste in football teams. Yeah. And my record collection. And that's it. But you spoil them then? Well, that's what children are for. They are great boots, by the way. Yeah. Don't start looking. <laughs> that's what children are for. Why? How, how could you not? You know, clearly, when, if my eldest lad gets to when he's 17 and he's an arsehole, right, if he turns into a fuckwit and I don't like him and he asks me for a car, I clearly will go tell him to suck his own ass and get a job. But if he's a geezer like me, like a little dude, and he says, any chance of getting a car? I say, you know what? I'll get you two fucking cars. I'll get you one for going to work in and one for the weekend. <laughs> That sounds great. Uh, speaking of money, I recently interviewed Kathleen Moran, and uh, she said that people from the working class who make money always splurge them mm. all around. Is that true with you as well? I guess, yeah. I've wasted a lot of money on frivolous shite. That's yeah. what it's for, though, isn't it? Yeah. What's it for? Sticking in the bank and fucking, you know, you can't take it with you. Do you still do? Not so much anymore. I kind of know, I'm kind of aware of the value of money now. Like, back when you're... 27 and you sold 18 million records in a year you don't think about spending millions on cocaine and fucking women and cars that you can't even drive and houses and smashing shit up and fucking nights out clearly if I was behaving that way now I'm 48 I'd be deemed to be a bit of an arsehole 
more by myself than anybody else. But um, money is for spending. What the fucking hell do you want to keep it for anyway? The more that you put in the bank, the more the government are going to take off you anyway, so you might as well fucking spend it. Mm. What's your biggest problem? My biggest problem? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that the ongoing march of time is the one thing that annoys me more than anything. The fact that I will eventually end up going grey, I'll eventually be a little fat man, I'll eventually won't be able to wear trainers anymore, or jeans, or I won't look cool in the end. That's annoying. But other than that, I don't really have any problems with life, do you know what I mean? It's Life is for living. Would you like to recommend something, anything? If there's guys out there listening and you want a happy, long relationship with a woman, tell them you love them every day. That makes life a lot fucking easier. Even if you don't mean it, it makes the day a lot easier. But if you can say it with meaning, and mean it, good God, it makes such a difference. And to all the girls living, or listening even, out there, you know that certain time of the month... Just go easy on the fellas. Do you know what I mean? It's not our fault. Who do you think I should interview? Have you interviewed Morrissey? No. He'd give you a run for your money. Thank you. Uh, I will say, though, this has been quite... I've enjoyed this interview. Oh, thank you. It's been one of the best ones I've done. I would like... I would like to hear you interview my brother. All right. Because I think he'd find you very intimidating. (laughs) All right. Because you don't ask questions that anyone can wriggle out of. You may be forced to confront some uh, home truths. Other than that, I don't know, Kanye maybe? Thank you so much for your time, sir. It's been a pleasure, and I mean that from the bottom of my swimming pool. Noel Gallagher. What a man. Such a one-liner king. Everything he says is funny, intelligent, important, something. I love him, and, uh, well... Yes, I need to do this more and I need to try to interview Liam Gallagher as well. If you're listening, Liam, please send an email to varvet at varvetpod.com. And uh, speaking of email and such, check out our sponsor, squarespace.com. And uh, I'd also like to thank Lovisa Olsson for the editing and uh, so forth and Christina Jörling Biro for producing Thank you for listening. Talk to you in two weeks. Bye-bye.